Hello, my name is Mark Mazabak. I am co-CFO of the China Youth Symposium. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Jacques Delisle, the Distinguished Professor of Law and Political Science at the University of Pe um, Pennsylvania Law School, Director of the Center for East Asian Studies, Deputy Director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China, and Director of the Asia Program at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. <coughs> Professor Delisle is a good friend of the China Youth Symposium. And he was actually at last year's panel entitled The Role of Law and Political Reform. I was lucky enough to be his point person last year. And this year, I had the satisfaction of actually being able to book his plane ticket <laughs> for, for this year's symposium. Um, it was the unanimous opinion of our entire leadership team that we wanted Professor Drillo to come back and speak again at this year's symposium. It was only a matter of where in our program we would like him to speak. Um, with extensive knowledge, on a number of topics involving law in China, Professor Delio could have spoken essentially anywhere in our program. Uh, I think it is apt that we eventually chose, and he graciously accepted, for him to address our David Rawson Memorial Lecture, the lecture that instigated the founding of this symposium six years ago, and one that we are incredibly proud of. <clears throat> Professor Delio's researches, uh, Professor Delio researches and teaches on many topics, including legal reform and its relationship to economic reform and political change in China, the international status of Taiwan and cross-strait relations, China's engagement with the international order, order, legal and political issues in Hong Kong under Chinese rule, and U.S.-China relations. His writings on these subjects appear in a variety of fora, including the International Relations Journal, um, edited volumes of multidisciplinary multi scholarship, and Asian Studies journals, as well as law reviews. He has also served frequently as an expert witness on issues of PRC law and government policies, and as a consultant, lecturer, and advisor to legal reform, development, and education programs, primarily in China. Today, he will touch upon the complex topic of maritime territor territorial disputes in his lecture entitled, Why the Sea is Boiling Hot um, and Whether Pigs Have Wings, China's Rising Power, the military of maritime territorial disputes and the problematic roles of international law. Uh, please help me welcome Professor Jacques Delisle. Thank you. Well, thanks, Mark. Thank you for that uh, kind, uh, kind introduction, and thank you all for braving the weather and, and what's been a long day, I know, uh, for everyone. Uh, it's, it's really an honor to be here. There's been some terrific people who've given lectures in this series, including last year, Joe Fusmith, who's an old friend. A couple of ex-ambassadors, I think, have as well. So it's an it's intimidating uh, company to be in and tough acts to follow. Uh, it's also, of course, uh, quite an honor to, uh, to speak in a series named after someone who clearly meant so much to so many people here. Uh, with that in mind, I've tried to tailor a topic that I think fits some with uh, David Rawson's interests. Uh, there's a big Navy component. Uh, it's certainly a US-China relations topic in large part. Uh, and it's even got a little bit of a theatrical touch, yeah, with the title at least, I hope. Uh, so let me, uh, let me proceed here and try to explain a bit about what, where this title comes from and where I'm going. Uh, the, the title's from the Lewis Carroll poem, uh, The Walrus and the Carpenter. Uh, and this is one of the stanzas from it, which you may know if anybody reads, uh, reads a th uh, through the looking glass uh, anymore. Uh, the time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, uh, including why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings. Well, why the, what I want to, to do in my talk, therefore, is to talk about why the South China Sea and the East China Sea have become, in a sense, boiling hot. That is, to the point of military and quasi-military, in the sense of the white-hold vessels of Coast Guard and maritime police enforcement, that their presence in both of these areas, from China and from the rival claimants, and that these were, although I think unlikely to lead to military conflict again, certainly were the biggest flashpoints in the region until North Korea recently reestablished its status as the gift that keeps on giving uh, for those who like to do national security stuff. Um, so, yeah, the, but these are still crisis-prone areas and uh, high tensions. Uh, and of course, it is not just about the rival claimants, Japan and China, in the East China Sea with the Taiwan component as well, uh, or the many claimants in the South China Sea. It also, of course, deeply involves the United States as a treaty ally of Japan and a state with close security cooperation with many of the South China Sea um, claimants. Uh, so this enduring nonsense poem from which I've drawn the title uh, precedes the boiling hot sea uh, portion uh, with uh, the 
Walrus's statement that there's uh, many things to talk about, and so I'm mindful of that and will try to keep my remarks short. Before I turn to the main part of my talk, let me just explain the pigs have wings part of this. is a, uh, an idiom which I don't know how well, how well known it is anymore, but it's, uh, and pigs will fly, uh, which is an expression meant to suggest something that is extremely unlikely. Uh, so I think that the, the boiling sea is fairly obvious, the, the uh, hot territorial conflicts that we've seen in, in both uh, of China's principal near seas. Um, but the pigs have wing refers to essentially a sense that uh, we're not going to see um, a resolution of this problem. And I'm going to try to suggest why, uh, that, that we can manage it, uh, that military conflict is unlikely, although not as unlikely as a flying pig perhaps, but a durable resolution is at least for now quite far over the horizon. So uh, on to talk of the uh, many things here. Um, what makes China's uh, um, near seas uh, issues, I think, so uh, so uh, contentious here to preview the argument a bit, uh, is th that uh, what makes it unlikely to be um, something that can be the focus of a uh, of a of a resolution, as it were, um, is basically we're seeing in, in the South and East China Sea disputes a problematic interaction of an area where international legal rules, which track international politics to a great great degree, are profoundly unhelpful and indeed. Uh, invite conflict, particularly where those on the one hand interact with, on the other hand, the circumstances and the tactics that China, and to a lesser degree, the other claimant and interested states have pursued. Uh, so let me just frame this a bit with a story that I'm sure is familiar to most of you, but I'll give a quick uh, overview, which is the recent history of significant friction and conflict in these two maritime zones. Uh, there have been tensions and occasional clashes over many years in the South China Seas. Some of the high uh, water marks or, or high tension marks anyway, um, in the 1970s when China seized the Paracels or the Xixia Islands from uh, the Republic of Viet uh, Vietnam. Uh, and then we've had a you know, series of backs and forths after that. Another high point or low point was reached in 1995 with the Mischief Reef incident and some military uh, skirmishes around, around the area. Uh, but it had been relatively quiet for quite some time until you get into a few years ago. Uh, in some sense, the the uh, South China Sea had heated up again around 2007 over uh, resource issues as it began to look possible that the potentially vast hydrocarbon uh, resources there might be uh, worth exploiting and exploitable. Uh, but the real recent uh, bad moments really start around 2010, uh, resurged again in 2012. Uh, uh, and you know many of the stories here. Uh, Vietnam, particularly a claimant to the Spratlys or the Nansha Islands, uh, we've seen that as, a, again, a recurrent uh, source of friction. The most recent uh, flashpoint there was China formally establishing the city of Sansha to govern uh, those islands, uh, both the Shisha and the Nansha Islands, to assert that these were Chinese territory in a particularly robust and formal way with a government and a garrison established on them. The Philippines last summer, as you know, the dust up over Huang Yen a Reef, which ultimately ended with a net being stretched across the reef to keep the Philippines out. Uh, and a recurring U.S. role as these frictions have increased over the last several years, uh, where we've had the U.S. making ever more pointed statements about the American interests in the South China Sea, which include keeping the sea lanes of communications open, making sure that the disputes are handled peacefully, and insisting that everyone follow the rules of international law, which the U.S. Required, views as requiring um, openness in, in an area of, of significant international security interests and uh, major uh, maritime traffic. Oops, did that not go? Yeah. Okay, I've lost control. There we go. Ah, that one. Okay. Uh, so in the South China Sea, um, as you know, there are multiple claimants uh, here. Uh, it's a very ugly map. Uh, it's probably hard to see from any distance, uh, but the very ugliness of this map is part of the problem. There are a number of overlapping claimants. China claims uh, virtually all of the landforms in the South China Sea and much of the water adjacent to them. That's the famous nine-dash line, the thing you can see in yellow there. It's called the nine-dash line by some, the U-shaped line by others, the cow's tongue by those who prefer uh, biological metaphors. It used to be 11 dashes, but the two of them in the northwest corner uh, were removed for reasons we can get into later if anyone's interested. Uh, and then you see overlapping claims uh, running off the coasts of Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, a tiny bit for Indonesia, and Taiwan, which more or less stands in the same shoes as the PRC, asserting the Chinese claims to the area. Um, so again, here in, in, uh, in this, era, in this uh, uh, zone, we see you know, multiple overlapping uh, claims that have been sources of friction, again, most notably uh, historically and recently 
with the Vietnam, uh, uh, Vietnamese claim and the Philippines claim run, running up against China. Uh, then there is the East China Sea, of course. Again, another problem with deep-seated, long-standing routes that had been relatively calm for some number of years. Indeed, we'd seen progress toward joint development of a gas and oil field, the Chunxiao field, as the Chinese call it, between China and Japan. Um, near the Diaoyu or Senkaku Islands. Uh, this is actually a very tough topic to talk about because what you can't even agree on what to call the things, right? You call them Senkaku, you're pro-Japanese. You call them Diaoyu, you're pro-PRC. You call them Diaoyu Tai, and you're pro-Taiwan. Uh, so I'm just going to call them the East China Sea issues, uh, islands here, and hope that that will do it. Uh, that too had been relatively calm. We'd seen some progress toward development, as I said, of, of, uh, of the hydrocarbon resources. And then on the Japanese account that starts deteriorating in 2008, wherever you date that, by 2010, we've got a real problem when the uh, Chinese fishing trawler uh, does a sharp 90 degree turn and rams the side of a Japanese Coast Guard vessel, uh, thereby triggering the arrest of the Chinese uh, captain uh, and, and a sharp deterioration in Sino-Japanese relations. And then more recently, of course, the sale of the islands, the nationalization of the islands, which had been in private hands uh, in Japan, private family hands, and facing the possibility that the rather nationalist governor of Tokyo, Ishihara, would, uh, would take these islands from the private owners, would, would purchase them from the private owners, uh, the Japanese central government, I don't know that at the time, stepped in and so-called nationalized them. Uh, and uh, in, in uh, the East China Sea Islands in particular, you see you know, people going out with their flags, right? I mean, the Japanese flag, you get Hong Kong people out there, Taiwan people. Uh, there are all these efforts to stake a claim uh, to these areas, which obviously uh, create incidents that are focal points for a significant friction. Now here, too, uh, the, you know, the U.S. has, uh, China reacted very badly to the nationalization of the islands. Uh, but here, too, it's not just the claimants. It's not just China and Japan with a somewhat smaller role uh, for Taiwan, although a fairly large one. Meng Jiu did his uh, doctoral dissertation <laughs> on the claims to these islands as a matter of international law and has led to a lot of Chinese um, uh, nationalism being bound up with that and a lot of Japanese suspicion. The Meng Jiu is, is you know, profoundly anti-Japanese. but. Uh, it's a side story. Uh, anyway, what we have here again, though, is a case where, uh, where the extra-regional great power has been involved as well. The United States has weighed in, uh, and some would say, I think, even more, pro more prominently, more assertively, than in the South China Sea, where the U.S. has been quite vocal on many occasions, Hillary Clinton's trip to Hanoi and Hawaii and various other uh, ASEAN-related fora as well, in insisting the U.S. wanted a peaceful resolution and wanted obedience to international law in the South China Sea. In the East China Sea, but what the 2010 incident and the, and the uh, island uh, nationalization incident has led to is a clearer statement that the U.S. views the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty as extending to those islands, not on taking a position on sovereignty, but that we view the security treaty as extending to the Japanese interest in maintaining the current administrative structure, which has been uh, Japanese um, administration over the island. And a clear statement of the U.S. opposition to attempts to change the status quo without consent. Um, now, the uh, concerns have, uh, in some sense, heightened here, particularly in the East China Sea, but also the South China Sea, amid China's recent leadership transition, uh, where we have seen reaffirmations, and some would say stronger statements, of Chinese positions uh, that uh, are part of what has led to the confrontations here in the first place. So we've heard from uh, the Hu Jintao and Jiabao era, but recently strongly restated by Xi Jinping and the new leadership about the importance of China becoming and being a major maritime power. And Xi Jinping's recent statement that there is no room for negotiation about China's core interests, uh, the He Xin Yi. What counts as core interests is something uh, that has been very vague. It's always been used for Taiwan for Xinjiang, for Tibet. Uh, and the question is, does, how much does this extend to these maritime zones? Well, as you may recall, there's a big dust up over whether Dai Bingguo in fact said to Hillary Clinton, that is the state counselor in charge of foreign affairs at the time in China, whether he in fact said to Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State that the South China Sea Islands were part of China's core interests. Certainly that phrase is used colloquially, uh, but it is, uh, it is very loaded because core interests means interests over which China is willing to use force. I use force to protect and assert. Uh, and in some sense, there is general language that asserts that any territorial claim, anything that is Chinese territory, which is the Chinese position with respect to these islands, uh, is a core interest. So it's been fuzzy, uh, but it's at least walked up to uh, the edge. Um, now, what I want to do now to get into the main part of, of what I have to say, it's a little more analytical and a little less uh, descriptive, is to say that much of the confrontation here uh, and the, the, the risks that we see in the two maritime zones 
is best understood in terms of several conceptually distinct elements in China's claims to these two maritime zones. So the first element of the Chinese claim uh, has to do with territorial sovereignty and the importance of history to claims of territorial sovereignty. Territorial sovereignty is at the core of these disputes uh, and territorial sovereignty is terribly prone to friction and confrontation because it's about all or nothing claims. You can't be a little bit sovereign. It's a little bit like being a little bit pregnant or a little bit dead. You're on one side of the line or the other. The land belongs to somebody or to somebody else. And this is an area in which international law does a terrible job of keeping things from spiraling out of control. International law tends to follow and reflect rather than shape the rules of the game in international relations. And here there are a few clear rules and often little basis for clear resolution of competing claims making the kinds of legal claims that can help bolster one's political claims uh, or not. Uh, worse still, this is an area of international law where history does much of the work. And although you know, I almost once was a lapsed historian or something, I think history really becomes, uh, in this particular context, uh, particularly messy and problematic. China's historical claims with respect to the East China Sea and South China Sea Islands, and to some extent waters, are relatively radical. That is, what they say the history is and how much they say the history matters in solving sovereignty claims uh, are really quite striking here. In its most radical form, in the South China Sea, there are elements of the Chinese position that sound a heck of a lot like a claim to sovereignty over all that water inside that 9-U-shaped cow tongue line. Now, uh, many analysts would tell you that that's not true, that China's position is simply about the landforms within that maritime zone. Uh, that gets you much of the way to where China wants to be. Uh, but it is striking that China has not, in any clear and decisive way, abandoned a claim that it actually has sovereignty over all of those waters, which has huge implications for other states' rights to be there, of course, um, including the passage through of their ships to some extent. Uh, so you see a lot of unofficial Chinese statements, the kinds of things that you get from people who push the envelope, former military people, retired generals and such, retired admirals too, uh, who will say things like, this is blue land, right? Uh, it's like uh, Chinese territory, only wetter. Uh, you, you do get things that really come pretty close to saying that. Uh, and China has been pressed many times to say there is no assertion of sovereignty over the water. It's only the land forms within the nine dash lines. And there was a the foreign ministry pre press conference with the inimitable Hong Lei, who was the spokesman for quite some time uh, last year, which is often cited as a statement that China has finally given up the claim. But if you look at it, the question and the answer are interestingly asymmetrical. Uh, you know, the, the, where basically the answer, said, the answer was China does not claim all of the South China Sea. No country can claim all of the South China Sea. Well, of course, the nine-dash line is only about 85 to 90 percent of the South China Sea. Uh, and, you know, many U.S. interlocutors, including uh, some uh, really terrific uh, international law researchers at the U.S. Naval War College, have, have made this argument to Congress, have made this argument to Chinese interlocutors. I've done it, too. You can't get anybody to point to anything that definitively takes this one off the table. And if you look at the laws that China has adopted that affect its claims unilaterally to these realms, things like the Chinese law governing its territorial sea, its contiguous zone, and an exclusive economic zone, and so on, there is this language about how these laws, which largely implement the law of the sea treaty and its obligations, do not affect China's historical rights. Whatever historical rights China has stand outside uh, the rules of the law of the sea regime. Uh, and so that marker is put down too. We're not quite clear what historic waters mean. The law of the sea is very vague on this. It's some, some element of it. It's not very robust, uh, but it may give you something. So here the legal rules are really quite problematically unclear and the Chinese claims about them are as well. So there's at least a suggestion perhaps of a claim to the waters, certainly a non-repudiation of a claim of sovereignty over the waters in an area where the very vagueness and peripheral nature of historic waters claims in the law of the sea regime means we don't get very much clarity and so everybody uh, can argue about it and worry about the possibly maximalist Chinese claim built into this. Now, to be fair, most of the Chinese historical claim here is not about sovereignty over the waters but about sovereignty over everything inside uh, that a nine dash line, everything that the land forms within that area. Um, and of course the issue in the South China Sea is not primarily the value of the rocks, it's about the value of all the stuff around them. 
uh, the sea lanes, the hydrocarbons, the fishing resources, the security interests and in being able to regulate who can go there uh, to whatever extent. Um, and you know, because these are largely, despite those poor PLA guys who have to get their boots wet, uh, this, the, despite the fact that those guys are there, these are basically uninhabited and uninhabitable uh, islands. That means that history matters more than it usually does in establishing sovereignty, simply uh, because it's all very uh, thin. And so the history here itself, of course, is quite thin too. And so China relies on things like claims of discovery. We have Zheng He up there for a reason. Uh, you know, the great Chinese uh, Ming Dynasty explorer. He's actually a latecomer in the Chinese story about Chinese discovery. It may go all the way back to the Han Dynasty. It depends on which sources you read. But the claim uh, from China is that China found it. And that if you discover something, uh, they then, under the doctrine of intertemporal law, that gets you something. That is, that was enough in the old days for terra nullius, uninhabited land. And so you stick a flag in it, you put it on your maps, you're there. And so what you see is China stressing this history, which is necessarily quite thin and therefore quite hard to prove. And especially quite hard to prove that it's thicker than anybody else's history. But the claim is China discovered it. That gave China a basis for a claim. Chinese fishermen were there. There are pottery shards for, that appear to be Chinese that go way, way back. Um, and there were military patrols uh, that went and naval patrols in the area. And all of these show a Chinese historical uh, connection with what was unoccupied, unowed land. And the claim is this, uh, this gets you more than anybody else uh, has. And China also claims from history that everybody else acquiesced until it looked like this stuff was actually worth something. Uh, so uh, there's a little dispute about Ramos in 1956 in the Philippines and about the Vietnamese getting interested in the 1970s. Uh, but by and large, the Chinese want to say everybody else acquiesced for a long, long time, which reinforces the Chinese historical claim. So they invoke the Sino-French Treaty uh, from the Qing Dynasty era. Usually, treaties in that area, era do not get much respect in Beijing because they're part of the unequal treaties doctrine. But this one accepted that everything to the east of the line was Chinese, so it's at least selectively uh, usable. Um, and uh, the, again, this claim that all the other states um, didn't really do much for many, many hundreds of years while China was uh, acting uh, as if it was Chinese territory. Uh, and, and in particular, uh, North Vietnam was quite quiet during the period when China was starting to assert some roles there out of socialist solidarity back in the day when that sort of thing used to exist. Um, and then there was a claim of Japanese acquiescence at least until, in the East China Sea, at least until 1895, uh, the Treaty of Shimonoseki, which cedes uh, these islands along with Taiwan and others uh, to Japan. Other states have contrary histories, and they especially reject this argument of acquiescence, uh, notably many of the South China Sea states, but also Japan as well. Um, and they also reject another piece of the Chinese argument, which is to cite the Potsdam and Cairo declarations during World War II, where the allies in the Chinese view bound themselves as a matter of treaty to return all those stolen territories, that is to say Japanese stolen territories through unequal treaties, bound themselves to return that to uh, China. So, that's the history, and the history problem here is with respect to the landforms, even more so than the water that I was talking about earlier on, China has a very expansive notion of what the history gets you. And here the Chinese reading of history and sovereignty and the tight link between them is something I would suggest that is pretty close to once it is ours, it is ours forever and nothing can change that. That is the treaties that purport to realign sovereignty which is done was done relatively routinely uh, in the international system. Uh, on the Chinese view, either necessarily are, or at least in the specific context of Chinese experience, uh, are the products of coerced, unequal, invalid treaties. True for Taiwan, true for Hong Kong, uh, true for, um, for many of the islands uh, here, particularly the East China Sea uh, islands. Um, and so uh, in the Chinese view, the loss of these territories uh, in the island, the loss of sovereignty over them, the purported loss of sovereignty over them, I, is, is the product of a particularly ugly history of foreign encroachment, uh, extra colonial, extra territorial colo colonial encroachment and imperial encroachment on China's uh, sacred territory. Uh, and it is uh, also partly the product of the West's fail to, failure to live up to its promises in Cairo and Potsdam, which again uh, are, are seen as treaties by the Chinese side, but not by uh, the American side. And any failure to get back these territories to assert Chinese sovereignty over the South and East China Sea islands therefore runs the risk of being a continuation of the history of a century and a half of humiliation. So in other words, the history that is core to these claims of sovereignty, perhaps over the water, certainly over the islands, is a neuralgic history for China. 
And it's a neuralgic history that is the product of China's military weakness, particularly its naval weakness. And so there is this easy step over to the notion that uh, having a robust naval presence and a military maritime power uh, is essential uh, to undoing the harms that China uh, suffered because it didn't have those capacities in the Qing, late Qing dynasty. All right, the other piece though of claims to sovereignty is not history, but the exercise of sovereignty. And this is much more of a mainstream view in international law and, and the politics that it tracks. The preferred mode of claiming sovereignty is to actually use sovereignty. And there are good international relations reasons for international law to have this position that the exercise of sovereignty counts a lot, right? We don't want people going and rearranging who controls people and territory. The problem again here <coughs> is that the territory we're talking about uh, is not territory that you can do the ordinary things that sovereigns do with. There are not people on most of these islands in any significant uh, number. Uh, you can't really govern them because of their uninhabitable, largely uninhabited, uh, and indeed on top of that, they're highly contested, so who would want to move there, uh, landforms. Uh, so what we see is all the parties in China taking off in the lead in this, exercising what little sovereign authority one can exercise under these circumstances. So what do you do if you can't actually put your people there and govern them? You draw maps, right? Uh, you draw maps that say this territory is ours. So the nine dash line is the most famous one. It actually started as an 11 dash line under the Republic of China, two of the dashes got erased. We can talk about that later if you want. Um, when China, what China responds to uh, Vietnam and Malaysia making a submission to the continental shelf delimitation uh, process at the UN uh, by saying uh, we're, we're issuing a note verbal that says no, we don't buy the Vietnamese and Malaysian uh, border drawings. Instead, here's our map. And it's largely the nine dash line uh, and some baselines are thrown in as well. Uh, China passes laws again on the territorial sea, the economic zones and so on, which assert that many of these landforms are part of Chinese territory and that maritime rights are based on a pertinence to those territories. Um, most recently and arguably most provocatively, at least within recent times, you saw China issue a baseline map that drew baselines around the Senkaku, Diaoyu, whatever we're calling them, islands. Uh, a rare case of China doing that over territory it does not, in fact, control. Um, so you map. Second thing you do is you put them formally under your jurisdiction. You can't really do a whole lot to govern. So you create a government on paper. Now this goes way back. The Chinese arguments, the white papers with respect to the South China Sea Islands, we'll talk about, and the East China Sea Islands too, we'll talk about how these were under the jurisdiction of various Chinese provinces, Fujian, Guangdong, Taiwan, depending on which islands and which times. Uh, they were set up as under prefectures and so on. Um, and most recently, of course, we get last year the creation of the Sanxia City, which has its own People's Congress, its own mayor, it has its own garrison. I mean, it's got everything you could want. Uh, they're promoting tourism, they're building docks. I mean, the idea is to make this uh, the next Hawaii of Southeast Asia. Um, not likely to happen, but these are form forms of exercising, you know, of, 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 trying, of exercising jurisdiction formally and then trying to go the next steps, actually occupying. Uh, so you see the things like the temporary structures that get put on these, these reefs and atolls. You see the developments promised uh, for Sansha. Uh, and you see particularly in Taiping Dalatu, Iba, the biggest of the islands, which has a Taiwanese uh, presence on it. The biggest islands actually controlled, as I said, by Taiwan. The other thing you do is you regulate, right? So what you do is you um, say the Chinese government issues a seasonal fishing regulation. You can't fish during certain times of the year. Philippines issues parallel ones, by the way. Um, you do things like Sinook, one of the Chinese national oil companies, state oil, state linked oil companies, will put up for auction certain tracts for development. You, um, you have the Hainan provincial government issue regulations for maritime law enforcement. It says we're going to regulate those waters off the South China Sea islands. And you send out particularly, and we saw this most dramatically recently in the South, in the South China Sea with Huang Yuan Reef by the Philippines, uh, Huang Yuan Reef by the Philippines, and, uh, and in the Diaoyu Senkaku area, you send out the white hold vessels, the Coast Guard vessels, to get real close, and you have the Navy, the gray hold guys, just behind them. But it's a real show of force with, with ships and uh, aircraft saying, we are out there uh, doing regulation, law enforcement, and military patrols up to the edge of these. Uh, zones. And way back when, in the, in the case of the Shisha Paracels uh, group actually taking 
the islands back in the 1970s. So there's this, uh, this importance of trying to do what you can to exercise sovereignty, but all you can do is pretty thin. And when it's pretty thin, it's pretty vulnerable, right? Uh, but the worst thing about this is not only do you have to do that, you have to stop others from doing other, you have to stop your rivals from trying to exercise sovereignty because it's so easy to leapfrog past you with a thicker exercise of sovereignty. So we see this going on as well. Uh, so you see uh, things um, like Chinese vessels driving off oil exploration uh, vessels from an India-Vietnam uh, joint venture undertaking. You see driving off fishermen, uh, that was the, the uh, issues we've seen um, in the exercise of the fishing controls. China's uh, had its fishermen be victims of that as well. Um, and you see things like when Vietnam made clear to China that it was about to pass its own law asserting jurisdiction over the nearby maritime areas, that's what prompted the establishment of Sancha City and a garrison as a reaction. When the Philippines sent its uh, patrol ships out to uh, stop Chinese fishing in uh, Scarborough Shoal, the Hunyan, uh, Hunyan Island area, uh, that's when China sent out its vessels and ultimately after the, the frictions uh, last spring and summer, uh, put a net across the reef. When Japan arrested the ship captain in the trawler incident in 2010, uh, China went nuts about it because it was an exercise of purportedly domestic police powers over a ship in an area that China considered to be its territory. And of course, um, most recently, uh, with the nationalization of the islands, again on the Japanese view, it is a standard domestic thing. All we're doing is changing the real estate owner here, whether it's the government of Japan or the family, whereas in the Chinese view, it was an in-your-face assertion of Japan's right to issue uh, ownership claims to these uh, chunks of land. So there's a real invitation to conflict here, uh, each side trying to um, uh, avoid the other taking too much of an action of sovereignty, trying to assert its own higher level of sovereignty in this area where the ability to exercise it is really quite, quite thin. Now, you know, for those of you who are law of the sea junkies out there, you're saying, but wait, you're talking about maritime rights, not sovereignty for a lot of this. These patrols aren't actually entering, uh, it's entering zones that close off others from access to the near landforms where others are already controlling them. But the answer is twofold. One is the maritime rights that I'll talk about in a moment, again, all hang on these claims of sovereignty to the landforms. But more important at the moment here is this dynamic of, of exercising sovereignty as best one can and resisting exercises by others, uh, is that we are seeing what uh, the International Crisis Group in a recent report calls China's reactive assertiveness. That is, this reading that says China is just waiting for somebody to push a little bit the Vietnamese sea law, the no denationalization, and then it comes back with a somewhat escalatory, uh, stronger gesture to push the others back. Or if you don't want to go as far as ICG does, you can more charitably say that this whole pattern of thin exercises um, are all that is possible, but international law demanding some exercise, and the politics behind it demanding some exercise, means that there is this uh, risk of a cycle of escalation. And in, in the most recent times, we've seen a couple of things which are potentially potentially the most significant move since the seizure of, of the Paracels in the 1970s. Uh, but that, that is because we have seen actual changes in the status quo of control over fairly significant uh, land masses within the realm of the insignificant land masses here. Uh, that is, the Philippines do not have the kind of control over Scarborough Reef that they did before last summer's incident. Now there's a Chinese net across it. Uh, and uh, the, 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 as Chinese sources at least have insisted whether or not you, you buy this as, as a state of affairs it's likely to last. There has been a change in the degree of control over the Senkaku. It's still under Japanese administration, but the Chinese presence um, and indeed the Chinese calls on Japan to recognize the new reality are, are um, a sign of, of efforts to change the status quo of actual control. All right, uh, the next point I want to get to here is that China has an expansive and relatively radically revisionist set of claims about sovereignty over the islands and thus what follow from it. So China, unlike um, the other principal claimants to the South China Sea, claims that every land form out there is Chinese. Most other claimants only want some of them. The maps are kind of hard to see, but as you can see, lots of Vietnamese flags, uh, a few Malaysian, uh, some Taiwanese, some Philippines, um, and a handful that are PRC. Uh, so um, China claims that all of those landforms, many of which it does not in fact control, are Chinese. 
and, that, and it claims that the East China Sea Islands, which it also does not control, are Chinese as well. As you can see, that's where they're, they're located. Um, and for all of these, the claim is that China has unchallengeable sovereignty over them. Now, uh, that said, China does recognize the international legal principle I was talking about a little bit before, which is that exercising sovereignty matters. But what this does is it puts China in the position, given who actually controls these islands, where it, it inevitably has to claim that it has a right to, uh, and has therefore some pressure to, sometimes change the status quo of who controls or occupies uh, these islands. And that's why the Huang Yan Island, uh, the Scarborough Reef business, and the uh, challenges in the Senkaku may matter so much. Now, in addition to claiming that all of these landforms are Chinese territory, the other piece of the Chinese claim here is not just who owns uh, the landforms, uh, but which landforms count. And on the Chinese reckoning here, every last little thing is a significant piece of territory. So uh, what you see going on here is uh, a claim, despite the mainstream international law of the sea uh, view, that uh, only inhabitable islands get the full zone, the 200 miles of EEZ and all the rights that go with that, continental shelf and so on, um, that uh, uninhabitable islands get less. China wants to count as, as uh, islands that get the full zones, uh, things which many would say don't rise to that level. Uh, China likes to take the little rocks that are semi-submerged and use them as a basis for drawing baselines. So basically, what you've got is another area where international law is not terribly helpful because all the law of the sea has these rules. There's room for dispute about just how big something has to be to count as, uh, as a habitable island. What does it have to do in terms of trucking in water, or boating in water, and, and, and food, and other such things. Um, so there is this ambiguity about which of these landforms count. As you can tell by the constructions on those little rocks that barely stick up, China's goal is to drive more of these to being inhabitable, and therefore inhabited, in these cases, uh, by the hapless PLA guys who get stationed there. Um, but th so, so again, we have an area where there's an incentive to do things that other sides, uh, other sides of the disputes regard as provocative, and an incentive to keep others from doing that. So, which, who owns the landforms? China. Which landforms count? Virtually everything. Uh, and uh, although China has not fully clarified exactly how it views each of these um, landforms, uh, there is a, a general sense, of, uh, not again precisely articulated, that a lot, of, a lot of things are being ginned up as getting a lot of pertinent rights that, that many would think they don't get. Um, China also then draws very expansive baselines. So again, law of the sea has some rules on this, but they're not super clear. They don't necessarily in most cases, issued definitive resolutions. So, you, so China takes a rather expansive view of the ability to draw straight line baselines around these clusters. So you get big chunks of water uh, treated essentially as internal to these, uh, these scattered small land masses. That, of course, gives you a great deal of, of control and rights. Uh, and then you see um, part of what drives the cow's tongue and the nine dash line is that China wants to then draw EEZ um, uh, boundaries in a way that are roughly equidistant between the small rock or island that China controls and the mainland of the neighboring country. Now, again, law of the sea doesn't help us very much here because there is no principle that says it must be equidistant. There's this mushy notion of you could kind of weight it by how important the interests are to one state or another, and you're supposed to probably give some weight to large land masses rather than small things, but none of this is definitively resolved. Indeed, the little international law we have on this says there's no one principle except that you should do it fairly and without using force. 